to the exciting session, second session of this uh, meeting today at Deakin University. The we have two uh, talks in this, one talk and one panel discussion. And we need to. We are running uh, quite late, so we have to make sure that the public lecture starts at 3:30. So we need to conclude our program by 3:15. So we have about 15 minutes instead of one hour. So we will uh, try to uh, stick to the time and keep the discussion for later. So now the first talk is by Dr. Dosna Zahn, Director, Center for Budget and Policy Studies in Bangalore. She will talk about the many facets of limited access, the internet, smart devices, and learning time. Yeah, thank you. And uh, good afternoon. And um, so I should start by thanking Madhurima and Ram for uh, including me. Perhaps the only non-physicist, uh, non-scientist in this uh, room. And uh, and since you know we always complain that they are uh, discriminatory towards us, I thought I would rather turn it around and say that you know they have not been discriminatory towards me in allocating me this post lunch session you know to keep you alive but they have put faith in me that you know i would be so good that you won't be able to sleep despite a good lunch so um, yeah so with uh, that i will start and and some of the points have already come in various manners uh, i will so we have done quite a bit of research which started uh, much before covid and that's why uh, we have engaged with this issue and many of those things that I'm going to talk about have already been hinted uh, uh, by many of these, especially uh, I think the inaugural talk by Ram talked uh, about many of these, so in some ways it will be elaboration. And uh, um, Professor Bamba also uh, talked about certain things that would be here. So, uh, you know, so this I uh, started because this was very ironical. Uh, and this, uh, so this is a lesson in NCRT Hindi textbook, uh, class 5, where they are trying to perhaps uh, uh, by including this story, the purpose was that children will be able to imagine, you know, it's a science fiction based story, that they will be able to imagine a time when they would learn only uh, in front of a machine. But uh, what was ironical, even as a personal experience, that my daughter was in class 5 in COVID year 1, and she was reading this story in front of a machine uh, uh, in uh, 2020 and not in 20, not in that uh, 2155. And uh, so it became a reality world over much sooner than uh, what you know some of the scientists and writers uh, had imagined it to be. And that has pushed us to engage with that. Apart from the fact that you know it, it was becoming a reality, but I think pandemic exposed it all. You know, we, we realize both the potential and limitations much more than we would have in a natural course of time. Um, just to again uh, 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 give a perspective that, uh, mm, especially in higher education, UK Open University, which started in 60s and is considered to be a very prestigious, actually, in terms of uh, degree, uh, was one of the front runners and, and it did push a lot of ODL, open and distance education based, and which also uh, uh, became technology enabled uh, learning later. And uh, research across the globe, if you look at it, it basically uh, tells you that it has potential of wider reach due to flexibility and choice uh, and cost effectiveness, which are of cited reasons. and. Uh, is, but also what has happened that, uh, you know, we, the developing world, is always trying to uh, catch up, you know, because we, we are trying to having the same and, and a lot of global initiatives have also put that pressure that you also should, all your, all your children be in education or whatever 40% of your adult should be there. There are these global uh, so-called goals. Uh, earlier it was education for all, then came millennial development goals, then sustainable development goals. And it does put pressure on governments, and especially high population uh, governments. Uh, um, there are nine countries which UNESCO has defined as E9, which have huge population to educate. Uh, India definitely is one of those. India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, three Asian countries, you know, apart from Nigeria and Mexico. So, 
so you then look for alternatives which are cost effective, which so called cost effective, uh, at times not necessarily cost effective, only low cost. Uh, uh, so and it would help you reach if you it would help you uh, uh, assert that you also have gained those goals. So that happens. If you look at research uh, uh, on these, which includes school as well as higher education in India, what you see is, and, and these are the major institutions at school level and university level, and the new like courses, which are open courses. Uh, uh, what you find that it's mixed experience, and that's how one has to look at it. I will not go into it. But what has happened, and that's important to uh, realize, and all of us are very well aware of that, that both policy and market is pushing it. And uh, this is not to say that one, you know, it's necessarily a bad thing, but it does put a pressure and onus on us, researchers, academia, and all, everyone, to see where it is good and how it should be done so that it's beneficial. And it doesn't come at a cost of losses. And losses could be in various forms, we'll talk about it. And market is very, very uh, aggressive. And so is policy in certain manners, the way it's being pushed, uh, in, in, including new education policy. So again, as I said, we have uh, uh, engaged with it. Now here, digital divide, I think this, this was a report that Ram was referring to. He didn't give numbers and uh, sharing numbers, so in a way, elaborating. And it's very important to be aware of these numbers. Those of us who have things, who have access, for ourselves, as well as for people around us, many a times don't realize how deep the divide is. So it's very important to be aware of these, and this is NSSO and therefore very credible, and it's recent. It's not kind of you know ancient. So if you, if you look at it, it's, it's really extremely limited in terms of reach. Uh, only 9%, you know, between 5 to 35, and this we are talking of youth. You know, we, we all keep talking about uh, demographic dividends. We are talking of our young population. But this is our young population, 5 to 35. And, and they don't really have access. Um, and the access, I think the things that we need to mark here is that there are divides. There are rural urban divides. And these again, you know, I was uh, uh, mm, mm, telling Madhurima that one needs to be nuanced. Uh, rural urban is only rural urban. Within urban, there are uh, uh, mm, mm, hundred walls. So urban is not one. But you, even at an average level, if you see, similarly rural, rural is not one. If you start looking at intersectionality, you will find that, for example, a Dalit girl perhaps has least access. Hmm. So if we go there, then you will find far more nuanced picture. But even at an aggregate level, you will see that it's extremely limited and uh, 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 and it has all kinds of its economic quintile its caste its location uh, its religion everything has has, has a uh, role but then if you look at small studies this puts data from one of our studies it was not that small but as compared to nsso it's small about uh, more than 3000 households and two so more than 7,000 actually, uh, more than 6,000 respondents, one parent and one uh, young person, two were interviewed from one household. And uh, this was post-COVID, around like during COVID. And uh, what do you find? You find that there is a clear gender divide. It's, 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 men have much more control over phone. So again, when you converse, everyone would say that everyone has phone. What are you talking? Everyone had smartphone. And that's such a deep belief. It doesn't come from, you know, any, uh, uh, not that they, they are uh, vicious towards you. They believe that everyone has a smartphone. And it's 100% accessible all the time. That belief is not based on fact. And there is a lot of difference between, uh, so even parents, so fathers have phones, not necessarily mothers. And I don't, I uh, didn't put it, like, it's full of data. But what we realized that if mothers have control over phone, children have much more access, especially girls. Then girls also get it for education as compared to fathers have. And it's not linked only 
through the father's mobility, it's also linked with mother's aspiration. So if mothers have, they also want the daughters to educate. Again, put it up there. Uh, care work, again, known. It's not that it's not known, but it's important to have numbers in front of you so that you can say that it's true. <coughs> that even young girls have much more responsibilities, free time they don't have. And uh, on the side I have put, because that's from another study, where we actually did a uh, uh, mm, work on care work for IT-based professionals, because you know that's that's the most, and, and you have large number of women working in IT, unlike many other sectors. Uh, and it's still not a feminized sector. You know, all other sector where you have women, those are feminized sector. IT is not yet a feminized sector. But there also we, what we found that when it comes to care work, it's it's much more. Uh, uh, on women. So the, a woman IT professional does four times more care work than uh, uh, a man IT professional. So that's on the side. But that's on the side, but that's what determines. No, that's part of the society. That determines gender norms. So the norms are such that you have uh, uh, far more uh, responsibility of care. And care includes chores as well. It's not only care. So time and space. Again, I would say known, but it's important to put it out there because again, when you when you say this in policy circles, they'll say, oh, that's ancient. Now that's not true. Uh, or uh, in the South, when I say this with my surname, making it very clear that I come from Bihar, they, they say, it's maybe true in Bihar. It's not true in the South, which is not true. So we have data from Southern states and uh, mm, so, uh, no, I hear this. I, I have heard this. So, um, mm, so it's important to put data out there that, you know, this is the reality. Um, but the bigger thing is that when we talk to young girls, especially, you know, when during COVID, when schools and colleges were closed, uh, they all talked about the fact that that was our only way of getting out from home. And I think that's an important thing we have to, when we talk of technology-enabled learning, online learning only being the solution, we have to take that into account. It's not only about, you know, whether I'm learning physics or not, it's also about whether I'm meeting my peer or not. Whether I'm getting to laugh or uh, talk with my peer or not. That's equally important and equally important for education. 15 minutes? Okay. So, uh, mm, okay. Uh, so that is an important thing and science teaching I won't go into because we uh, 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 have talked a lot about it and you all know that much better than I do. Um, better and safe and that's again the same point and I would like to talk about. This is also, you know, it is becoming and, and a lot of international work has shown. Uh, I mean, I had a, you know, I used to work internationally and I had a project in Pakistan. And uh, there what happened that when they started this open university, and especially for teacher training and those kinds of things, the higher, uh, uh, the face-to-face -face enrollment of women went down. Because this was considered safe. So, you know, you have your daughters sitting at home and still they're getting their degrees done. And it's not only a Pakistan. We did an NIOS tracer study, and I tell you, we couldn't even reach girls, because despite the fact that all our researchers were girls calling them, because they won't allow those pass outs of NIOS, which is, uh, and class 12 pass out, uh, so which is adult, it's not that they are minor, and they didn't allow those girls to talk. And they, and whoever we could talk, it was much more for marriage than for anything else. So, you know, this online learning and especially these courses are also pushing women towards that. That you know now the marriage market is such that you need a you know undergrad degree to get married. So our girls will have that undergrad degree, and uh, therefore you know so you are pushing them there. So it's also these aspects are as important when we are pushing courses you know towards that realm. Um, pedagogy that's a very very important thing that you know again as as morning we were talking about that it's also about. Uh, you know, education is a deeper exercise. It's not only a community exercise, it's, also, it's, it's not only a socialization process, but it's also an exercise where you learn from each other. There is a cooperation in, in that that is needed. And that, uh, this uh, online learning 
completely curtails. That's how I would put. Technology has allowed you to address that in some manner. You know, there are you have breakout groups, you have all those things. You have you can create a community of uh, uh, say peer. Yet it's not the same. You know, you you don't look at each other. You don't have facial expression. You don't. You know, there are all kinds of things. Again, you all are teachers. You know that. And and a lot of research exists on that. Transactional distance, there's a lot of research. Alienation, there's a lot of research. So uh, uh, autonomous learner, it's considered like absolute must for uh, uh, this kind of learning. Where is the autonomy? You know, a girl who can't even decide whether she would do this or that, where is the autonomy? Uh, and forget about girls, even boys. You know, expectations from boys also are extremely high in our society. So, uh, so that autonomy itself is a, is is kind of uh, almost absent. Um, I talked about mobility. I have this and one more slide. Um, so this is something that we actually have tried. Uh, uh, this is taken from one of our uh, uh, published uh, paper. Uh, uh, that what are the thresholds that matter? This is again not to reject technology-based learning. But to say that you have to have these, you know, these are barriers and therefore these are thresholds. Especially when you go to uh, younger age, I know you all are in higher education uh, uh, and students who reach there, they have basic skills. But younger age, when you are, you know, uh, dealing with school children, they have no literate environment at home. Literacy matters. When they come to college or school, there is a literate environment around you. And that also helps in learning. So it's it's the, all kinds of things. Affordability matters. You know, we did our survey and we uh, realized that okay, half of them have phone, but we realized that when we went back, we wanted to do a cohort. Half of them had not recharged it. Other uh, many people who did not have phone earlier now had, but many who had earlier now did not have. Uh, in terms of like smart device, they had the device, but they did not have the connectivity. So affordability matters, and uh, mm, the rest matters. Access matters, infrastructure matters, and uh, mm, individual capacity matters, and so does socio-structural aspects. This is the last one, and therefore uh, the whole argument is that you can use, and technology must be used. Uh, 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 mm, but how is it used is, is, the, is the whole issue. And uh, uh, if you are designing something, then you have to keep these in mind. Our design actually does not take that into consideration. If you look at you know, what happened in, uh, during COVID, uh, mass media, you know, mass, you know, all our, I mean, we did survey in four states and there are others who did in other. We have actually pulled and we have tried to see nowhere, nowhere in the country, watching of TV programs for educational purposes went beyond 11%. It, it went as low as 1%. So 1 to 11. And this is not because of the presence of TV. Presence of a, you know, Katara TV is more common. But how, you know, whether that could be used, so it was, uh, uh, the barriers were many. The program as at 9 o'clock in the morning, when all girls are doing household chores. You know, even that, you have to take into account. This is one thing. So there are many things that one has to take that into account when you are designing a program. Coming to more complex, I mean, those are easier things. Even those are not done. But the more important things, for example, how do you do? How, how, what are you doing? Suppose if you're talking of girls' education, and I have deliberately used the word transform it along, uh, along with, you know, a very transformative curriculum has to be subversive. How do you do that? Uh, how do you, you know, even if then, suppose their mobility is being affected, how are you designing the curriculum to ensure that they start thinking differently? that you ensure some kind of mobility. You can have a program where you say that they have to, if they don't come, the certification will not be granted. Can you, can you do that? Can you make it blended in a manner where a residential one month is compulsory? There are such programs in certain uh, uh, countries. It's not that it's unheard of. So you, but, 
but the thing is that those who are designing those who are uh, you know providing people like you and people who sit and make policies they have to first be committed to those goals but if you are yourself not committed to those goals if you you know if you want gender equality which is more notional rather than substantive then you will not go for such choices but if you and not only gender in wider terms if you want to break the hierarchies that exist in our society you have to you are talking of northeast if you want to break the prevalent notions of northeast you have to do things differently and at the level of policy you have to do things differently at the level of institutions you have to do things differently uh, and that that's what so whether you are really committed is is i think a huge issue uh, mm, similarly in terms of uh, um, materials for example uh, we are researchers we are not implementers but since we had an action research uh, going on at the time of covid we felt kind of compelled to do that schools were closed and we had 700 children with whom we had our research we realized that we just cannot do any online with them we started sending them letters and those letters were subversive we we had maths lessons which were centered around kitchen activities you know to acknowledge that there is a lot of maths in kitchen you can't do estimation you can't do cooking without estimating we all estimate you no know? so all those huh. so all those you know to that extent you have to think if you are teaching physics i mean uh, uh, to be honest uh, uh, for this workshop which also focuses on women in physics i don't see men physicists here i'm sure they exist so so there is a side lining of of many issues and that is uh, 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 deep rooted uh, unless we and that's true for technology also you know technology is taken as a panacea and you don't look at any socio cultural structural uh, uh, economic issues and therefore it becomes restrictive so everything can be done but your commitment to fundamental education fund social capital you know we all i mean i keep saying and i uh, in my office there's a joke that i am very well networked and that network has come from my educational institutions and the places i have worked so you know if you go to a university which allows you to network and all your life you reap benefits of that that comes by going to the university that doesn't come by sitting at home so those things also one has to take into account when we are making policies when we are designing courses thank you thank you